Okay, we're back. Uh, this is the last in this series about Jesus that we've been doing. And uh, this is overall has been in a series uh, called Knowing God that we did. And there has been some great studies in there. They've helped me. You know, I hope they've helped you. And they've just built confidence and uh, just uh, they bring us closer to Jesus Christ. Um, this study here, this study about Jesus, I told you before, and I really feel this way. There's been about four of these studies just about Jesus. I think you could take these just as themselves and teach people about Jesus just with these and use these studies even separate from the others. In fact, maybe a lead in to the others with those others, but this can just give us zeal and conviction about Jesus in these studies. And this one here is a continuation of last week with the resurrection. So we're going to look more into the facts about that and understand understand that, you know, with Jesus raising from the dead, and, and so many people, they make up a Jesus and they make up a God that is of their own making. They do not necessarily get their feelings about God and their attitudes and their picture from the Bible, but they've kind of framed up their own picture of God that's not necessarily one that would be true. So uh, whenever we come to the resurrection and you understand and believe fully that, yes, this is a true event, Jesus raised from the dead, then everything he said about heaven and about hell and about eternity is true too. And everything he said about following him and how important it is is true. So um, we are going to look at these things today about this resurrection and some things for you to think into and for me to think into about the truth that's in them. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we pray as, as we begin today that we have an open mind and open heart to your word and we understand uh, whenever we find out the truths about your son Jesus Christ and about his resurrection that we can become full followers of him with zeal and conviction of uh, your word of truth that you've given us. Uh, bless each and every one that is out here and help us to always uh, be doing things for the right reason and, and be motivated in the, in the right direction. And these things we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well today we're going to do some answers or questions in summary, and we're going to see about, and we're just going to kind of ask these questions. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, where would Jesus' dead body be? Think about it for a second. You know, if it was true that Jesus didn't raise from the dead, because there are literally lots of other religions that believe that Jesus existed, you know, uh, those in critical fields of philosophy and of uh, antiquities, you know, historic, you know, they believe that Jesus existed. But this thing about the resurrection that he raised from the dead, well, it stops there. Um, they even believe he's crucified, but this whole deal with the resurrection, I'm telling you, it stops there. So, you know, whenever we look at this, this is going to be very important because, you know, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then there must be a body. You know, there must have been something. How could this have went uh, 2,000 years and not have been noticed? Well, there's three possibilities, three main possibilities, and we're going to look at those. So, uh, here we go. Uh, the first is uh, Jesus' uh, disciples stole his body. Okay, that's what they did. Now, um, would the disciples believe in Jesus themselves if, if Jesus predicted that he would die and on the third day uh, he would raise to life, okay, and, and th that prediction not come true? Okay, because Jesus did. Remember last week we looked at Scripture in Matthew 16 about Jesus raising from the dead. So I ask you, okay, if Jesus had predicted these things and he didn't raise from the dead, now, now that's exactly what they had, uh, what what the Jewish leaders had tried to to put this on. Let's go over here to Matthew and in, uh, in chapter twenty eight. If I can get you over here really quick, Matthew in chapter twenty eight here, Jesus um, has uh, has raised from the dead, and we have the guards report. Okay, and let me make sure I've got you over here. Okay, verse eleven in chapter twenty eight. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest and all, that all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while uh, we were asleep. And if this should uh, come to the governor's ears... We will win him over and keep you out of trouble. 
and they uh, they took the money and uh, did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Wow. So they wanted to be able to get a story circulated that the disciples stole the body. So one of these reasons we wrote down here is one of the things that they tried to circulate. Well, the thing is about a stolen body is where is it? Okay, uh, would they have tried to destroy the body in some ways? Well, uh, usually uh, something like uh, that you wouldn't do. It would be more of a shrine in one way or another um, in, in this. But anyway, that would be uh, one of, uh, of the ideas. Um, but why? Why would these disciples believe in him? If it wasn't true that he had already prophesied about it, so this didn't come true, why would they? Why would they believe in him? You know, would the disciples be willing to die for a lie? Well, that's a very big question right there. Are you going to give your life for something that's not even true? Are you going to die every one of them and, and be willing to do that? Because that's exactly what happened. You know, many of the disciples were persecuted and martyred. You know, the probability that the disciples sold his body at zero. All right, his enemies stole his body. Well, we can think into motives. Why would they have done that? Uh, if uh, you were Jesus' enemy and you had Jesus' body, the disciples were preaching that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, how would you refute the disciples' claim? Now think about it, okay? The enemies of Jesus stole his body. Now, at first, there's some thoughts about, well, why did they steal it for to start with? But let's say they did. And say all of a sudden, like uh, these disciples start preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, making all these claims that Jesus raised this, uh, you know, healed this person and, and all these things and the things they can do are because of Jesus. Wouldn't you produce the body and say, oh, really? Well, here's the body we took. You know, yeah, here's your Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? That wouldn't make sense. You know, Jesus' enemies never had the body. Uh, you know, if they did, uh, Christianity would have ended at that time. The probability of that happen is just zero. All right, what about the third one, that Jesus rose from the dead? So either uh, the disciples took his body, his enemies took his body, or Jesus rose from the dead. You know, at first the disciples did not even believe and they were afraid. They couldn't even get this in their heads themselves. After Jesus appeared to them, they believed and they were not afraid anymore. You know, even death did not stop them from preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. Think about that. Whenever, you know, it's one of those evidences that we just kind of overlook, and that's the fact of the change in the disciples. Something happened that changed them. The probability of this, and it matches up with the evidences in Scripture, is like 100%. Now, what about this question? Was Mary hallucinating whenever she saw Jesus? Jesus. Okay, it is possible that Mary was hallucinating whenever she just she, she saw Jesus, right? Uh, you know, surely that could be an answer that uh, obviously it's something that people have looked at. Well, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 through 8. Now, let me tell you about this scripture in 1 Corinthians 15. This is one that even the critics let me go back over here and talk to you for a second. This scripture here in, Ma in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is one that even the worst critics of the scriptures believe 100% that Paul wrote this and he believed what he was saying. So know that as we're reading it. They have not disputed the fact that Apostle Paul, you know, a fellow by the name of Paul, wrote this scripture. This is the details that he writes down, and they believe that Paul believed what he saw. Okay? Now, they've disputed a lot of things about well, what made him see this. Was it mass hallucination or whatever? But anyway, let's read what it says in Matthew 15, 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, now that's Peter, is that's his name, then to the twelve, 
After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. He means they've, they've died. In verse 7 it says, And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. These are words that are not denied by anyone. People have tried to figure them out. Why would Paul say something like this? Why would he write? You know, you have to realize there is is a group of people that get on uh, different services, you know, such as uh, a video service, YouTube, or something like that today, and they use that as a grounds of spreading the gospel, or spreading their gospel, I should say, and trying to just say, oh, these people never existed, you know, Jesus didn't exist, and Paul didn't exist. You know, they try to go over all this, but then you can get into another group of real scholars, the ones who teach at university levels and teach the Old Testament history and the New Testament histories, but they're not necessarily even Christians that teach that. But uh, basically, within all that, even people who are agnostic in their thoughts, whenever it comes to this book, they don't believe it's false information. They believe it's true. They they believe that uh, that Paul wrote what he believed down, and they're just trying to figure out why he wrote it down. That's where they are. But basically what Paul says in this is the 11 apostles saw him as well as 500 people. It gets really hard to deny that Jesus was alive or wasn't alive whenever all these people saw him. That's what Paul says has been declared that's went on. You know, this means that there's over a thousand eyes that saw Jesus that had rose from the dead. So it wasn't just a one or two people who, who saw it. It wasn't just even a select, just his little group of disciples. We've got over 500 people that are eyewitnesses. And Paul goes to the trouble of saying, hey, most are still with us today. A few have fallen asleep. A few have died. Most are still here. In other words, if you don't believe me, go talk to one of those 500 and they'll tell you the same thing. Yes, we saw Jesus and he was alive. All right. Uh, Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let's go over there. Acts chapter 1. Okay. Once again, this is Luke writing. Okay. The first account I composed, Theopolis, remember that name? About all that Jesus begun to do and teach. Until the day that he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God." All right, so here we have Luke's beginning words here in the book of Acts, and that's the Acts of the Apostles is why it's called the book of Acts. Okay, so whenever we read it, uh, it shows that he gave many convincing proofs over 40 days. So that it wasn't like uh, he was here for one day and gone. It says over 40 days, many convincing proof. 500 people saw him alive. The possibility of an hallucination of over 500 people, it's just not even possible over a period of 40 days. The probability of that is absolutely zero. All right. All right. So who do you think that Jesus is? You know, there is only four real possibilities on who he is. And this is a, a sermon of many in their selves. So we're going to go over this right here. Uh, number one, Jesus was a lunatic. He was crazy. Okay? Now, uh, he, he only thought that he was the Son of God. Hey, there have been others. You know, there, there's been others down through history who've thought there was a Son of God. There was a book uh, called The Three Christ of Ypsilanti, I think, was the name of it, a book that was done. You know, and it was, I think it was actually used. These people thought they were God or thought they were Jesus, these three. They did study on them. But basically, everybody knew they were crazy. You know, that, that's how it ended up. But with Jesus, 
You know, he spoke with such wisdom. Wasn't like somebody who was crazy, was it? And many tried to trap him in, in, uh, in his words or, or find fault in his life. But they were unable to. You know, Jesus changed so many lives. Can, can a lunatic do that? Can someone who's crazy do what Jesus did? No, I don't think so. I don't think we would ever, or anybody would ever say that Jesus was crazy. And that, that's what it was right there. He just thought he was the son of God. You know, the claims he made, he just, he was just, he was, he just thought he was. No, he didn't fall into that category, and you and I know it. Jesus uh, is a legend, okay? Uh, he did some good things, but the stories got bigger and bigger over the centuries. In other words, they're, they're so embellished that they're not true. Well, here's the problem with that. You know, there were many witnesses and many written accounts about his life that all support each other and many actual followers and believers. So the real people that were here during the time that Jesus was here saw these things, wrote them down, testified about them, witnessed to them, and then they write them down. So, you know, whenever we're seeing this repeated, you know, how embellished really are, really are they? I want you to think about this for just a second. I uh, wonder who the first president that you remember uh, would be. Well, I remember several presidents. Probably my first president that I, I remember myself is probably Richard Nixon. So I remember a little bit about Watergate at the time. I didn't know what it was. I just remember all the people talking about Watergate, Watergate, Watergate. That's what I remember here living in the, in the United States. But the first president I really would say that I remember uh, growing up as a kid well would be probably Ronald Reagan. You know, I remember uh, that time period. You know, I remember uh, before that Jimmy Carter well and, and stuff. And I remember Gerald Ford. I remember all those. But, you know, one that kind of, uh, you know, he really stood out in, a, in history there would be uh, Ronald Reagan as president. Now, if, uh, let's see, that was back... In, uh, I believe he went into office in 1980. So let's see, 80, 90, 2000, 2011, whoo, 2020. Oh, is that really right? 80, let me, 80, 90, 2000, 2010, 2000. Is that really 40 years ago? Wow. Ooh. Boy, that's a sobering thought, isn't it? I want you to just think for a moment with me. The gospel writers wrote these books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Even, even Paul wrote writing uh, 1 Corinthians. You know, we're talking about the uh, Corinthian letters, late 50s, early 60s, AD, okay? We're talking about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, we're talking, you know, in the late 50s. Maybe Mark's even earlier than that. So Jesus died in about 30 A.D., 30, 40, 50, that's 20 years. Uh, say, you know, 58, you know, some of these writings, 60, 61, 62, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 30 years. I just, I was talking about Ronald Reagan 40 years ago, okay, being president. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's say that somebody wrote a book about Ronald Reagan. And in the book, they told about a miracle that he did of feeding 5,000 people. Okay. Uh, they told how he raised a, a, a man who was on a mat and who was known to be paralyzed. And he healed him and he told him to get up and take his mat and walk. There were some known blind men that, uh, you know, were there and Jesus healed them. These aren't just, you know, people who come out of the blue that nobody knows. No, these are people who live in your community who you know, and Ronald Reagan healed those people, and they're no longer blind. And then to beat all, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, he raised a person from the dead that had been in the tomb for four days. These are pretty outlandish claims. Now, if that book about Ronald Reagan made it into my hands and I see that book, I lived when Ronald Reagan was president. 
I remember his time as president. And I am going to tell you that the stuff that they wrote in that book about Ronald Reagan, that he did all these things, I'm going to tell you, it's silly. It's baloney. It's not true. It's false. And so would everyone else who was here at that time because we all know and we all saw that Ronald Reagan never did any of those things. So you tell me, would that book that had been written about that really stay around? So think about it for a minute. If you had a book of Mark that was actually written in less years than the distance between me and when Ronald Reagan was president, and you had a book of Matthew, and you had a book of Luke, and you had a book of John, and people started writing these things about this man who fed 5,000, about this man who raised Lazarus from the dead, and he had family, uh, Mary and Martha, uh, who was Lazarus' kinfolk. And, you know, you could, at that time, you could still see Lazarus a lot. And then that, uh, you know, they write down all these evidences about these things. And you think that uh, there's people there who are reading these letters, and these letters didn't come out in a book. Like we think, you know, we have the Bible and they're all in a book together, but these letters came out individually. Mark came out, Matthew came out, Luke came out, John came out. These little letters to tell Luke says, hey, I'm writing this to Theopolis to show you in detail how these things went down. So we see these and they give them their, their different angles or perspective about this life of Jesus and about his resurrection. And yet their stories crisscross perfectly. Do you think the people at the time, they're going to pick up one? They're going to say, that's silly. That's not true. I was right here. I saw Jesus. He never did these things. Uh, oh, no, that's crazy. He didn't feed feed 5,000 people with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the fish and bread. He didn't do those things. He didn't heal blind men. He didn't raise Lazarus from the dead. That's silliness. You know what would have happened to those letters if they weren't true? They would have never made it to us. They would have never made it out of that time period. They would have pitched aside as silly nonsense, but they weren't. And you know why that we have them with us today? Because they were true. And nobody was denying what was said and told about Jesus because they witnessed it for himself. In fact, they not only heard about the 5,000 men that were fed, let alone women and children, they were there and a part of it. They saw the miracles take place. They saw him on a cross crucified. And 500 plus saw that he was raised from the dead. Wow. This is no legend. Jesus was a liar. He deceived the people about who he really was. Again, he spoke with such accuracy and conviction about the truth that no one could trap him in his words or deny the power of of his miracles. You see, many signs and wonders, miracles, signs, and wonders backed up who Jesus said that he was. So he wasn't a liar. In fact, that's the very argument that Peter gives on the day of Pentecost. And let's go over there real quick to Acts in chapter 2. And we're going to go down here whenever Peter first starts preaching his message here. <clears throat> Now, I want you to look at verse 22 with me. Men of Israel, this is Peter preaching, first gospel sermon. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know. Wow. That's exactly how Peter went about this. He's like, look, you saw all these things. You saw he was attested to God. He was not a liar under any sort of the word. Well, the only other option is, is Jesus is Lord, just like he said. He's not a lunatic. He's not a legend. He's not a liar. He must be who he says he is. He's Lord. He's the Son of God. So what do you think about this Jesus? Right now, you have followed these and you have watched these. Where are you at on this? And yeah, you can walk away and say, I'm not thinking anything right now. But the truth is you are. You're making a decision. 
right now. If you're a Christian and you don't have the zeal that you should have, you know, maybe we need to look at the forgiveness that Jesus has given us as Christians. You know, maybe we're really not seeing it like it is. You know, if, if you're not a Christian, but you say, I, I believe, well, even the, the, the de- demons believe. The Bible tells us that, and they tremble. But there is more. There is, you know, this is this is faith that makes action take place because of that. You know, what do you think? I want to give you the same challenge that Jesus gave Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. If you're not a Christian and you are as sure that as I am that Jesus is Lord and he's the Son of God, you need to get your life hidden in his life. And the only way you're going to do that is by believing and obeying the gospel message. And right here in the book of Acts, let me take you over there once again, is where we see the first gospel message preached by Peter, and he declares the death, the burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I just want you to look at verse 36. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call to himself. And with many other words... He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. You too can be one of those souls. You see, that promise went out even for this time today. If you need to make a decision, why don't you get in touch with us? Why don't you get in touch with a a Christian who uh, studied and fully believes the word of God and repent of those sins and confess that Jesus is Christ and be baptized today for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit and start living your life with zeal and with purpose that's found in Jesus Christ. Let's pray and let's end this series today. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to come together to study your word. We thank you for all these different studies that we've looked at. And we pray that uh, uh, we can sort through our mind the possibilities, Father, but uh, the true truth of who Jesus is, that he is Lord and he is your son. And Father, help us to live inside of those truths. And these things we do pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for studying with us, and I am sure that we will come back with some different studies. But for this series, it's over. So if you haven't made it through all the lessons, I encourage you to go back and go through each one of these lessons. Not only can these lessons be taught to you, but they are very teachable for you to teach and share with someone else. Want to know more about them? Get in touch with me and let me know, and uh, I would be glad to get you more information on this series or anything else that you need to know. So thanks for studying with us.